Uh, hello, welcome to the third episode of the Steve Sash Schwartz podcast. And um, today I'm fortunate enough to uh, be interviewing a fantastic artist named Sibel Rowe, or better known as Belle. <laughs> <laughs> Easy and I. <laughs> yeah, and um, she's a great ceramicist, makes very large scale sculpture, um, but equally uh, she's an incredible painter, so she works two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally. And in this talk, we're going to get to know her a little bit and her background. We've known each other for decades and have exhibited together and have really enjoyed that. Became friends through the year, years, and um, I'm really honored that she's here as uh, my first interviewee. <laughs> and... Um, so just loosely around us are some of her pieces and they yeah. get to be much bigger scale and they're made out of ceramics, they're made out of cement, they're made out of uh, a combination of materials. And a really fantastic thing that she does is uh, combine unusual materials into her whole own vocabulary and like this lexicon is just incredible. And she works, you know, in, in different uh, scales, which is um, not every artist thinks she can work very small and make something incredibly powerful or something monumental and uh, mm. that's really uh, unusual to have that kind of range and dexterity and um, so we're gonna sort of yep. explore these topics and uh, you want to tell people a little bit about your background and yeah, sure. you know where you're from who are you why are you doing art why am i doing art no, <laughs> no choice well, I'm doing art. It's no called choice. you. <laughs> it, yeah, it's called the vocation and it's just how you're born. And, um, I have a big belief that uh, before we all became very joined at the hip in a contemporary society, we relied on people like us to tell stories, um, not just with words but with visuals because, as we all know, language and the written language came much later. So we're still here in the culture genetically, us us makers and so um, I didn't really get a choice I don't think I think it, it was just my genetics of how I was born to be a sculptor um, I really came I came from Sydney Australia I came from a, a very prestigious academic medical family but also a filmmaking family so and music a lot of music in the house so the arts were okay science and art were a very common language around a dinner table with six kids. So when I finished high school, I bottomed out, didn't fail art, didn't really understand school, so school wasn't my place, um, didn't really like people, so people weren't my thing. Mm -hmm. So basically I just whizzed through and I went to art school because I didn't know what else to do and that's when I meet, uh, met a fabulous ceramic artist called Peter Travis and he said, if you want to understand sculpture, um, come to ceramics, I'll teach you how to make every colour in the world, which is what we call glaze technology in the real world, mm -hmm. which they don't teach anymore, which is a real bummer. Um, and so I learned how to make every colour in the world and I learned how to make form. And the very first forms that human beings made were vessels. So that was why I started in ceramics. I learned colour, I learned form, I learned how to apply the colour and the form, I learned thermal technology. Did, did you have a natural sense of form? Because I find mm -hmm. like with sculpture, like the best sculptors, they have yeah. a sense of volume and yeah. weight and their yeah. material and you can't yeah. just get that randomly you know no, you i think to... it was gymnastics helped me with balance and form because mm -hmm. when you would when i was a gymnast everything was about visualizing yourself in space because you don't see yourself doing the tricks in space you visualize it then you do it right so my sense of body and space from when i was very young body was in space and so when I translated that from gymnastics to sculpture it was quite um how do you say it, it was a learned thing from a young age and I wasn't right. even conscious of it but I was oh. very like these things standing up with this balance with nothing else in them you yeah. know or this is just balance and this is just balance you know I mean you could push it over but you know <laughs> I now I'm gonna but anyway my point is is that um 
sculpture isn't about the outside for me. Sculpture is about encapsulating the space like a human body would. And when I lived in New York for quite a long period of time, the buildings were the sense of scale that I was always in competition with as a human be being building sculpture, right. not as a architect building jewellery for buildings. That's a different designer, not an artist, but that's another story. So when I got to the... I've always been conscious of human form and human scale in, in sculpture. So when I encapsulate a form, whether it's in big ceramics, which I'm well known for, big concrete, which I build all by my little two hands, I build everything myself, or whether I'm working in bronze, which I used to run a bronze foundry for years. Um, so if I'm working, I'm encapsulating. So most of the stuff I focus on, the inside space is as important as the outside visual. Oh, wow. The outside is a skin, the inside holds the space. Interesting. So do you think that helps give your work the presence that it has? Yeah, volume. The volume. And understanding, because if I was just to look at these like they're eggshells in space, which I jokingly used to call my ceramics because who builds 12 foot tall single piece fired ceramics? No one, because that's just nuts, you know? Like it's just, people build in sections like Right. Um, Vulkos and, and, and Balisteri and all the ceramic artists, uh, Viola Frey, and they built in sections and then glued them together on metal frames. And right. I just built one big fucking form from the ground up. Oh, sorry about my potty mouth. Um, and then, sorry about my potty mouth. Um, the the colour and the building and everything with me, it's not designed before. Right. It's all done as I'm building. So if I'm two, two feet up, I'm already colouring. Another two feet, I'm already colouring. I'll be inside the work building, and sometimes I colour the inside of the work and then keep building, come out on a ladder because I'm not tall enough. But the inside for me is as cave-like, organic and inspiring as the outside is. But the interesting thing is, is that as an artist, the inside is my space, it's sacred, because I've built it like that. But the viewer, you guys really don't get to trip on the inside of my works like I do when I'm building it. You only get the outside. But some of your pieces are yeah, inside, visible yeah. internally yeah. also. Yeah. That was when, yeah, are. most of them are. But most of them have stuff going on inside, like tagging and things like that. Oh, really? <laughs> Messages. You know, people bury shit in the ground all the time, you know, like those. So it's the same concept. If you look at how we learn culture through pots and the walls and architecture, um, they're all messages from the past coming into the present. Absolutely. So that's, for me, an interesting continual line. Fantastic. Ma. And um, you don't use only traditional glazes though on stuff, right? Like if you look no. around, like maybe... No, no, spaces. no, they're not glazed, they're concrete. So these are... Um, oh, what have I used? I use rubber. But you use tiles and I all kinds tiles, of crazy I use tiles, I use glass, I use rubber, right, right, right. I use glow in the dark, I use... I because it. at night time, I can't see my sculptures, so now I paint glow in the dark paint on them, so at night time, so I can see them. At, uh, yeah, I, love that. I know, right? <laughs> Just because it's my or they're amusement. very visible in really low light or whatever. Yeah, still, yeah and they still, pop. Art's still giving something. It well, doesn't yeah. just vanish. vanish at night. And I don't yeah. like to pollute the night with um, light, so I don't have big lights on my property out here in Joshua Tree, or Landers actually, it's because of the aliens. So um, <laughs> at night time, I like to be able to have the line of the form, which gives me another interesting way of looking at the work. Because I'm always thinking about you it. Mean, like... Yeah, or well, just where I've painted it, so it's a line. Uh, uh, and, 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 and of, of fluorescent, basically. So doing some really interesting things, which I've just started to play with. Hopefully they'll be ready by the October art tours is out here in Highway 62. Is um, they a lot of my research that I do for materials is from um, there's a big national da database of new technology. So um, I go on that and I, they've got a lot of Prescian Frontier stuff like um, glow in the dark concrete additives no way. so oh, when they so have fun. walkways in hotels instead of putting up things that people are going to trip on they've now pouring the phosphorescence or the um, glow in the dark uh, powders and gels and stuff into the concrete top layer 
so it comes up at night and then it's all solar so that goes away in the day which so that technology is being cool. built into my work at the moment too, right so. yeah and yeah. i remember a couple of years ago we were talking about that uh transparent oh i'm still room. doing those with the chunks of yeah, glass yeah. and it sort of kind of yeah. blows and i guess yeah. it's really hard to get right but no, it works. Yeah, I'm still doing was about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. But the th interesting thing about it is that the reason why I didn't continue as a two-dimensional painter, which I am still, I mean, you can see there I'm, I'm working on both sides of my linen. I don't know if you've got that in the picture, but it's... We're going to cut away and show yeah, you Yeah, well, I mean, so just... for me, it's like my paintings now have become stitching. That I paint on both sides, so there's a see-through translucency to the linen. Um, and, and it's the more surface. monochromatic too. Yeah, yeah, a lot of black, yeah, and, white lot of black and white. And, and I mean, those I do of you paint, just but... listening and not watching, try and make some uh, verbal descriptions. Oh, <laughs> yeah, not sorry. everybody's watching this. So. Yeah, um, yeah. So, anyway. sorry guys, I'll try and be a little bit more. No, it's fine. We're doing the, like a visual <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, but... but we still have to describe it to the people listening. Yeah, so, you know. well, you've only got to see a couple and, you know, really seriously, that'll be, <laughs> that'll let your imagination run wild. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, then yeah. we'll get the idea. So, um, it seems like you're working in a lot of different veins at the same time, isn't that true? Like you're mm -hmm. making the large scale sculpt, you're doing paintings, you're doing these yeah. weaving things, you're yeah. doing uh, the little winky lenticular yeah. things you were showing me this morning, so... Yeah. Um, you want to talk about that a little yeah. bit? Just like your breadth of interest. You're not just doing one thing. No, no. Well, I mean, I have a philosophy on that. This is for the art students out there who are feeling a bit insecure about where they're going <laughs> to go. Right. Um, art is, for me, there's two different ways to approach it. Um, for, for me, and I've got pretty crystal clear ideas after 45 years in the gig. Um, there are designers as artists, and they're still artists, but they're designers. Right. And then there are um, emotive artists or or, can, or artists that, there are artists that design their work before they build their work. Now, I call them very much locked into the design aspect of art, so the object or the message. So the message and the object is their primary concern before they even start to articulate the medium with which they're going to work it, right? So they've come at it from a very, um, it can be a soulful, but a lot of it, a lot of it is cerebral design oriented. Yeah, work. And, and process oriented. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Well, and then <laughs> there are people like myself and, and, and I'm not going to speak for you, you can speak for yourself, but say, um, I do a, a, a lot of reading, as if you photograph my art books at the moment up there. I mean, I, I read and read and read from every area I can, not just from art, from science. In right. fact, I don't think I've ever bought an art magazine unless I've been in it. <laughs> it's a true story. So I don't look at any other art, really, unless it's my mates or something that interests me. So, there's, mm -hmm. so my art comes from very science-based in a way that my my technology and my knowledge of my materials is big time and it's expansive because I've made a lot of really ugly, failed work. So I'm a big believer in archival quality. So I'll research a material, I'll let it sit for seven to 10 years before it goes to the public to see that it's got archival quality, which is- Seven to 10 years for real? Wow. That's archival quality. That's what you've got to have in a gallery. That's what you've got to back up with. So, um, so what I, I, I think is, is that my work starts with basically thinking about what I'm learning at the moment and whatever that is and however that is, whether it's got to do with space rocks and meteorites or cephalopods or, or um, fascia or, or new technologies in certain things, it doesn't matter where it comes from, that's the influence. Right, but it's, that's a whole world of your interest that when you go and look at your work, you don't see little no. octopi and stuff like It's like well, you're you parsing all that info it. down into some, some abstract it. lexicon or something. Yeah, well, that's the genius of being able to let art speak for you, right? I'm not, I, I, I am just 
And I'm not going to say like, I'm the vessel or something. I'm not. I'm just the mediator that happens to have the technology. But I have to continually say to myself, don't get in the middle of this. Don't, right. don't, don't get your brain all huffed up wondering if this is going to sell or not. It's irrelevant. Well, the market and the production, of yeah, those are two distinct things. Exactly. Also discuss that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's what I'm trying to say to art students. It's like, don't be afraid if you're not... When I taught how to make a living as an artist and not get stooped and mental health for artists, I wrote a, a program for community college. You came and were a guest for my students to show them how, to, how yeah. to make a living. And, and I mean, the, the thing I say to art students is, is that mediums will expose themselves to you when you need them. You'll start, no, I like, I, I went into making large scale lightweight concrete because sculptural form in big ceramics goes from the ground up. And I built sideways, up, I built upside down, up. I built every way I could, but I couldn't actually rotate the work as I was building it. And when I was scuba diving down in Hong Kong... Uh, sorry, just because it's too cumbersome... And well, like, too heavy. You can, it's, okay. And you can't get it in the kiln, you'll break it, right? So, and even concrete, before it becomes whole, it's still stronger than unfired ceramics, you know? Like, but, okay. but, but, but so, okay, so when I was scuba diving, um, I realised the, the ability to swim around something and to move something was what really influenced the next stage of me coming out of ceramics. I wanted to be able to move my work as I was building it. And that's where I went into lightweight concrete because I could move uh -huh. the work as I was building it. You can't do that with ceramics. And so in other words, just so people know, like, this is not a solid block of no, cement. This is right? hol yeah, this is a hollow freestanding um, Concrete structure, so and I can pick them up. It's not super heavy concrete, yeah. or is it yeah, it's not super heavy. It's a special thing mix. Or yeah, it's is. a tech thing, and I don't like fiberglass because it's bad for your lungs. So I don't use fiberglass. I use non-toxic stuff. You know, and I make sure I'm masked up. Students out there, masked up. Um, and then the surfaces are very much like the ceramic ideas because it's all. I don't really know what's going to happen when I make a big ceramics because I keep glazing over it and then I put a seal over that so I can't see and then I do another paint so it doesn't become obvious. The painting and the form doesn't become, you know, you see a lot of ceramic artists and they build this form and then they make sure that they do the, the glaze to or the decoration to go with the form, right? Well, I'd rather fuck that up. So what I do is in a very punk manner is I'll do one whole colour then I'll come back and colour the whole thing with a slab of, of clear glaze, which will mean that it'll all go purple or all go orange or oh, something. Right. And then I'll come back on top of that with another type of glaze, and then I'll cover that up, and then I'll come back That's on with another dope, type. Really? So by so the it's time like you're trying to annihilate the form, and then I bring annihilate it back the it. form, and I have no idea what's going to come out of the kiln. Yeah, so it. it goes into the kiln on a forklift, you know, because these things are massive and the kilns are massive. So they go in, they drop it down. It takes seven days to fire up wow. and down because seven yeah days well i'm hitching a, no 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 i'm hitching all. a ride with water pipe technology people i get to use water their kills for free technology? pipe you know like oh, they make pipe. big water pipes for oh. under the ground so i hitch a ride those things are fire uh, yeah yeah oh yeah big God. technology That's crazy. so instead of me are those using the biggest kilns in the world yeah, some of them yeah some of them yeah but i think the thing is is like i I continually have to trick myself in order to stay interested in the game. Like if I was one of the artists that designed something up front and then just built it, well, that I would not be interested. I would never have become an artist. Uh, like I'm continually trying to get up in the morning and see what sort of fuck up. So it's a real discovery it. process. Yeah, it's not it's like interesting. You're following a map and just nah, like, oh, what's interesting. Today. And I mean, that's why sometimes you've got to stay as far away from normal as you can. What is the normal art scene right now? Well, it's the same as it's been since the 50s and the 40s. It's, right. you know, that same old footpath and, and, and I, I'm not on that footpath, you know, um, because it hurts my feelings, <laughs> basically. And it gets in my mind and it doesn't allow me to make mistakes and 
make the best work I could possibly be making. They go, well, galleries, they'll support you and get you to where you want to go. And I'm like, well, the only place I want to go is to my next sculpture and I want my next sculpture to be better than my last sculpture in so much as it's interesting to me. Right, but so obviously you're the real deal artist working from your heart and soul yeah. and it matters to you. You're not doing this for no reason. On the other hand, mm. you still need to keep the lights on yep. and everything and uh, presumably move somewhere, place them in worthwhile collections or what have you, any collection. And um, do you want to discuss your attitude sure. about I mean, the art market per, per se? And don't ever think you're going to make a living out of making art because it's just ridiculous. It's like singing in front of the shower, sticking your artwork on the front of your mother's fridge and think that that's going to be your life. It doesn't work like that. The art scene is run by a group of people that are making their income off you. So let's say you've got a nutritional food pyramid. The very, very top is the artist. Underneath that are your collectors, right? You know, and then underneath that you've got your critics or the people that are writing for the magazines. Underneath that you've got your dealers in the very bottom rung, right? And it doesn't mean that they're not valuable. Everybody who makes the food pyramid, we know, can't live without the other. But we yeah, forget exactly. how important an art buyer is. An art buyer is as passionate and as loving and as interested in your work as you are in making it. So the most important part of selling art is your buyers. So you're saying like uh, the sincere feeling of the... The passion. Uh, the collector would like... They have to love the work. In, they in do. other words, as opposed to like, I'm getting a... Bell Row for investment. They're not thinking well, like that. They're thinking some like, people don't know what to do with their money, so they buy really expensive cars, and that's okay because that's what they're going to do with their money. And I know people like that, and people buy my work that think, well, we're coming to the desert to visit Bell, and we keep driving the brand new Tesla, the most modern Tesla up here, but we don't like the dirt road with the Teslas, so let's buy the new Bronco. Oh, look, we've got to pick up one of Bell's paintings. Let's go and buy a Rivian to do it. <laughs> You know, I know I have clients like this. Now, the thing is, is that I don't meet those clients in art galleries. Where do you meet your clients then? Uh, I mean, you're such a... Friends of... Because you're sociable? And... No, not really, because if you build it, they will come. <laughs> this is what people don't realise. If you want to be a visual artist and make money, you have to do something that no one else can do. I do something that no one else could do. But it's in a way, like, we're all in marketing. Everybody's in sales. Everybody's got to eat. You know, we're all entitled to make a living, so like, how... I don't yeah. rely on making a living from my art. I teach little ones, five to 12 year olds, which is my biggest passion in the world. I teach them how to do sculpture. I work two hours a week in um, the school system in Orange County after school, and I have sometimes 40 or 50 kids after school for an hour making clay sculpture with me. That's funny. Now, <laughs> that pays my bills. No way. Yep. Two hours a week. How yeah, that's how much I work. get like $30,000 an hour. I make $1,000 an hour. Holy shit. That works. Yeah. That doesn't hurt. But I've been doing like it. like a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, like a lawyer and then some. But I've been doing this since 2010. And the reason why I started teaching in that school system, after school enrichment programs, was because there wasn't any, any 3D sculpture for kids. Oh, I see. And I was I, having a son who's 25 now. Um, I taught maths in the school because I was good at maths, you know, and I taught all of this stuff in elementary school. And then I thought, well, I should be teaching sculpture because I teach in the little kids' class. And then that's how it started. And now I'm fully booked. But I only work twice a week. Yeah. Because I don't want to that overwhelm like myself. A killer gig, these, kids, yeah. these kids are great. And they ask me, the schools ask me now. So if you're an artist, there are many ways you can make a living besides not selling art. And personally, I think selling art should be on the lowest of your desires. Also, as I'm fond of saying, it's like the extreme sport of sales. Yeah. Selling art because generally you put your heart and soul into something. It might have taken five minutes. It might have taken 15 years. And you got to put a chunky price tag on it. People are like, well, do I want the new Tesla or do I want a new bill? You yeah. know, or whatever. And uh, and they should be priced accordingly. Yeah. 
you know, but uh, yeah, it's but they're true not. that not everybody, no. you know, knows those kind of clients and stuff, you know, high ticket price items don't always just fly out the no, door. No, they don't, right? but if you're making something, okay, so say when COVID hit, right? Now, no one's going to come shopping for a new sculpture in COVID because everyone's masked up in an isolation. So I started making sugar pots, metal sugar pots, and they were from when I was in Paris, probably 20 years ago, um, I saw these things called, um, ah, I forget what they're like, called. What but is a sugar pot? Like, is that a literal No, thing? they're French, yeah, yeah, they're French sugar pots. They're called pilons. And they- For like baking? No, 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 they're metal and they're round and they've got this little, and they, and they open up, right? So, and they're metal. And I found them mass produced in China. And I went, oh, and I bought the raw metal ones and I ordered a whole lot of um, enamel paints. And then I painted all of these sugar pots. So when you open them up, the sugar's in there and then they close up, they swing up and they swing down. They're really lovely. Um, they're, they're, they're very sort of 50s, 60s thing. So I just started this thing. I would paint at, at this little cottage industry as a big time, I suppose a big time sculptor, ha ha. I was making placemats. I was making yeah, was huge cool. tablecloths for people, linen, hand-painted tablecloths. I was making these sugar bowls with enamels. I was making jewellery, rubber jewellery that were 3D forms, very sort of Frank Gehry type abstract forms like my big sculpture, but for your neck. And, and then these are at like lower price points. Yeah, so all just, like all yeah, anybody could buy them. Anybody could buy them and they did. Right, and they right, did. Right. And that's how I made it through COVID. So would you... Uh... They're almost like art collectibles. Or They're just kind of little thing. things that people love to live in their houses with. They want to live with, you know, their dining room table because I would do both sides of the of the um, placemat. The placemats. Those are cool. I and know. and that people could change their look. So one side might be black and white and and very mon not mon. Yeah, you want to describe them a little bit. Well, I, yeah. I would say for one thing, like her placemats and the. Um, what do you call it? Uh, Tablecloths and table all that stuff We're and table runners. Just like her paintings, the same abstract vocabulary yeah. and that kind of thing and yeah. great palette and all that so just so just you know, they were like wildly well, they, they were a normal thing but yeah but they were a household art object the one thing that COVID did was made yeah. everybody look at their homes and I thought <laughs> okay everybody's inside their homes and I'm not going to bother making great big I mean I, I was still making big sculptures but yeah. what I wanted to approach was everyday art for everyday people and so they used to call it wabi-sabi in Japan, but mine's a little bit more educated. Is that what wabi-sabi means? Yeah, but uh, it's more like um, yeah, anybody yeah. uneducated can make artwork was basically what they were saying. Craft oh, people like can make genius artwork. genius. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically what I did was I just thought, well, I can paint pictures and stick them up on the wall or I can paint table runners and people can get a real kick out of that. Like it's actually an art object. So I was selling them all over the world. Singapore, Australia, Paris, Lisbon, everywhere. Like how? From but an online, email list, from a every, website? Like how on you... Instagram and my Facebook friends. And people Instagram. heard about it and they say, oh. So they would message you say, yeah. I want six I want uh, six. Placements. Yeah, or I want a table or... runner 10 feet long and three feet wide. Oh, you would make them custom? Absolutely, or I'd just make them and I'd, and I'd post them and people would buy them, you know? And I mean, I see, know that. and that's how you make, I mean, artists can't be thinking that a gallery is going to be their revenue. Artists can't be coming out of art school, which is a whole other story I could bang on about, but I won't um, too much because a lot of people go to art school because they need to learn how to think. And art school's a great place to learn how to think. You need to start reading from the classics up or Sumerians or whatever. You, you're going to find those people that are going to teach you how to think. So art school's good that way. But don't go to art school and think when you get out, you're going to go and be a college professor. That will kill your art career. I think things are different now than when we went to school. Though. Like when I went to art school, like it was so ivory tower and it was just about... You know, sure. do your work, make the best work you can, blah, blah, blah. And I just love yeah. it. But they didn't give you a clue, like, what no. you're supposed to do when you get out. Or, oh, no. now you have to be a carpenter, but I don't even know how to hold a hammer. Or whatever the heck. Yeah. You know, they gave now you, you need no, to be a welder but, on a deep sea ocean rig, but I only learned how to weld steel sculptures. But since the nineteen mid-90s, they started yeah. bringing by art directors, museum, all yeah. these galleries, right to the artist studios, like at Yale, at Columbia, the better art schools. And then 
you were put into this pipeline and you actually very influential people in our world would actually get to see your work, you know? And so it's very different than when we went to So like people today do have like an enormous leg up in the right art departments compared to what we have. Cause like, how do you even get to these people otherwise? You know what I mean? Well, therein lies the magic question, you know? The magic question is who are you building for? Well, Why are you building? Who are you building for? I mean, if I, I was thinking that the reason why I'm building is to aim and end up in, in a powerful gallery and have a, a house by the ocean, that's not going to make me make my next sculpture. Right. And, and how do I know that? You know, I know that because I was in galleries. I mean, I had so many shot solo shows. I'm my first solo show when I was 19, paintings and sculpture. So, I mean, I do know that that whole language. Now people say to me, well, now you're so old and you've been working for so long and you can do all this big shit. Why don't you go into a big gallery? And I'm like, well, the time will come. But I'm still really interested in building sculpture. And I'm not interested yeah, so when in- When you're with the right gallery, you're, any, like, you're still gonna be really interested in building your sculpture. I don't think you're gonna like get all cheesy and- Well, just, no, I don't know if I'm gonna know. get all cheesy, but I can tell you, most galleries are not wealthy enough to not give a shit about your money. Meaning? They take, they need your money to survive. Well, yeah. And, Very few but galleries. to be fair, they deserve it. Oh, no, I'm not saying they don't. Have a huge but they're two different things. They do. I'm yeah. not saying that, that they're bad. I, I have great friends that own galleries and I always, and I think they're fantastic, but they're two different things. One thing, yeah. you're making art for your gallery for your mortgage, if you will. The other thing has nothing to do with economy, nothing to do with critics, nothing to do with art galleries. It's got everything to do with the quietness and the knowledge and the skill sets that you put into your work. They don't have any outside influence. And if they no. do have an outside influence, then that's different than, well, for me personally, that's not how I roll. That's, and, and you can roll that way. You can be interested in going to Yale for your art. I mean, I've got my degrees. I did not have my degrees, but the reason why I got my degrees was because I couldn't afford to buy a kiln. And I kept having art shows, and I kept thinking, well, should I have to stay at art school and keep building um, pottery so I, and, yeah. and big vessels and stuff, which is what my passion was, so I could make money, so I didn't have to wait tables as much. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know that a lot of your people listening probably think that art galleries are the greatest thing in the world, and they are. They're great places to go and see art and everything, but you cannot confuse art, art scene, art galleries, art people, art critics, or anything. They are nothing to do with the magic that creates the work. Yeah. They, are, they are two totally different separate things, and if you can't put those hats on, you can't separate their hats for mental health reasons. One is your commercial entity that you bring your work to the public once the work's finished or right. as it's being developed. The other one is the quietness, determination, and self-respect that you have for yourself as a maker and as a sculptor and as mm -hmm. a painter. That is totally different. Now, none of those outside influences ever touch that person because the moment they start niggling in on that person, that person comes out feeling less than. Hmm. So the two for me are totally separate. And somebody said the other day, oh, well, we'd like to come over and it, as a critic, critique group from Palm Springs mm -hmm. and Palm Desert to your studio mm -hmm. to have a critique mm -hmm. amongst your peers. I said, you're not my peers. And they said, well, what do you mean? You know, like, we don't you t accept criticism? I said, not from you guys. And then they said, well, why not? I said, well, it's really simple. You are not more evolved than I am in what I do in sculpture and painting. Um, now, if it was Richard Serra standing there saying, or, 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 or Peter Shelton, you know, or somebody of that caliber that wanted to come in, bang on and give me a bit of a lesson about my work, I'll be all ears. But do you think they really met it? Maybe they Absolutely, just wanted to that's what, no. Maybe it was just going to be a discussion. No, no, no. Like, this critiques is what can artists, be, like, flattering. They don't have to be, I don't like, want to be tearing flattering. you down. I don't no, want I understand any, that. No, yeah. I don't want people to waste my fucking time. I mean, 
These guys are all getting to each other's and going, let's go and have a criticise Bell's work. Let's go and have a critiques group at Mary's house. Let's go and have a critiques group. It's like, dudes, get to fucking work. <laughs> Stop banging on. Stop trying to assage your egos and get to work. Because that, that political commentary, that social commentary on your work, that emotional commentary, hell, it could be mean because they feel insecure about themselves. So they could that be niggling mean. at you. Anything they've got to say is irrelevant to what happens between you and the medium. It is irrelevant. So why would you allow that in? Yeah, just for the sake of conversation, really, and I sharing would. your vision and work. And I don't think like criticism per se has to be negative. They might have said all kinds of laudatory things. Well, if I don't understand what abstraction is by the time I've finished a piece of art, and if I'm like going, well, fuck me, I like that. That's pretty out there. How the hell did you do that? No idea, Bill. Pretty interesting. Okay, move on. If I don't really understand what I'm doing in the concept of the moment, sometimes I don't understand it for 20 odd years. I get that. Um, we work from this liminal yeah, position exactly. and I'm like, you're just following your following nose everything. anyway. Like, exactly. Who can measure and judge that? Like, exactly. it's just absurd. And I, don't, and I don't need them. I don't want to talk about art with people who I don't respect. Yeah. And I respect you and I respect a conversation with you because I know you're a worker. So having a conversation with somebody who works in the arts and having a conversation with somebody who is in the arts are two different things. Working is working. So I can sit here and bang on with you. If we were to start talking about technique and technology and culture and history and all that stuff, we'd be, well, we've, we've been together for 24 hours talking about that and Stephen keeps Which going, shut up, Seville. We mm, want to talk no, about that. We want to talk about that. We want to talk about that. But, if, if, you know, and so so those those conversations you have that are interesting as friends, you know. Yes. But I don't want those conversations as artists. I'll come and lecture for you. I'll lecture at your college. I'll lecture at a show, I'll lecture at your dinner party if you want, but I'm not here to qualify anything. I'm not here for you to qualify me. No. And so that's the problem I find. Well, I know I'm a fan <laughs> of you too, but it's like, I'm not meaning to get heavy, but it's like what institutions are built on power and fear. They were built because they wanted to keep the illiterates illiterate and the literate on top, right? That's how we got the bibliotheques and you know all the all the learned scholars and everything nowadays we're we're at the age of the internet so if you want to become a scholar most of the courses i oh, have this for an example mit all free you don't get the degree but you can do every class at mit online for free That's you can insane. enroll for free to get all the information you want right so you'd have to be like rigorously self-educated because if you look at the statistics, like uh, most of those online courses have this attrition rate that is so extreme and only like 2% of the people actually complete the course. Yeah, but uh, it depends like what, you're, what you're learning for. You know, of if course, you're just learning for knowledge, or, I mean, look, I don't want a diagnostic neurologist to go in there and, 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 and diagnose my ALS for me if they've just gone to you know, online booty bot yeah. medical school. Well, I mean, exactly. I want somebody who's been at the done their 12, for 12 years. He's done their 12 years of hard tech, so they yeah, misdiagnose yeah. me. But it's the same in art. Like a lot of people, and I, I mean, I'm going to be harshly critical because I have taught and I do know who's in there teaching and I do know the quality of their work and I'm going to be really rough on you guys here who are art students. See it for their work. I don't know if it's, it's just well, honest. Maybe it will be taken see, brutally, but it's just like, look at, you got to get to the core of things. What's the point if yeah. you're not going to name it? In look art? at your professors as how good they are, not what mark they're going to give you, and then take it as a grain of salt. I never yeah. would have become the sculptor I've become had I listened to every art person I came across until... I evolved myself. I love that. That's why I'm doing this podcast because like yeah. now, like we might only have a few listeners, but over years we're going to have tons and tons and yeah. you're going to convey what you have to say exactly. with your big personality and your humor and your thoughts. Well, I'm a bit and, uh, serious now, what? but it's because it's a serious conversation. 
I don't want the artists of tomorrow, all you young lovely people out there, and older lovely, a lot of the people when I taught at community college had full careers in mathematics or something, and then at 80 decided they want to go back to painting, so they'd come to me. And I'd wow. say, well, you've had a lifetime of experience, let's just light that switch. You might have the technology, not the technique yet, but you'll get it. Right, the spirits in there somewhere. Yeah, and so all you young kids out there and all you kids that are starting off in the arts, don't give up because you don't feel confident about it. You're not meant to feel confident about making art. You're meant to feel questioning. And you're meant to feel insecure. If you're not insecure in the works you're working on, you're not striving. Right. I mean, when I finish a work, I go, like this one here, I'm sitting here seriously looking at it and I'm going, Jesus, how could you think that was finished? I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I've got to walk away from it at the end. You're restless. <laughs> I am. But when I'm looking at it, I'm just thinking, well, I'm not sure if it's successful, but I know that I've learned a lot of interesting things from the process and from the work. So as, a, as an individual sculpture, yes, it works. Um, right, but, uh, and, but you're not insecure about it. Like at a point, I would say, like, no. when the work throws you out of it, yeah. there's an element of satisfaction, like, Shh, I've been through this journey yeah. and now this is the result. And, and, right? and so many times I... I re redesign my work, I upscale it. I walk out, I see a piece, I go, I'm so sick of looking at that piece. Oh, yeah. And I, really I destroy it, and then I rebuild it, and you people really just think it's hilarious, you know? It's like, I love it. I love well, it. And, You're but, combining these elements to make something different yeah. than you, and then it takes you in a whole different path. Well, I'm, that. yeah. It's a real abstract expressionist kind of process you work It is, like, but... You're not like a Jeff Koon thinking about, like, Okay, I'm going to that four stories tall and well, it's going to be a profound a, little vessel. But he's done. a designer. He makes jewellery for buildings. He's yeah. a designer. He's a totally different worker. But so yeah, for me, when I destroy so... a piece, I'll rebuild it better. You know what I mean? Like, I won't just stick to it together. Oh, yeah, I'll just go, I'm going to reuse these forms and this material here and that and I'm going to evolve something new because when I made that 15 years ago, I was at this level and now I'm up here building. I don't want to have that around anymore. I want to absolve that into something new. But that just to go back to a second on the artists in art school right now. Yeah. I made a sculpture for the Keck Alzheimer's Institute in San Diego mm -hmm. and I had no money. I'd just gotten divorced. Mm -hmm. um, I was devastatedly sad. Yeah. Uh, my dad had just died well. and I had this commission uh, very hostile divorce then. Um, and so here I am with this commission with nowhere to live, right? I didn't have a house even. So I built the Alzheimer's Institute sculpture on my friend's kitchen floor who gave me his house. Um, he went back to his opal mine in Australia, this old digger. An opal mine, yeah. I see. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, but that's what he does. He dig, digs build boulder, boulders and stuff, opals, but we're friends. Wow. And anyway, so then, but what I'm trying to say is, is that that wasn't the interesting part. Like, when we put the work up, I named the work Tau. Now, I had... Tau. T-A-U. Now, Tau, in the Greek alphabet, means life. And oh. Tau... Is also a symbol of, of in Egypt for uh, life. Onk, like it's a, and, and when I made it, I didn't know what I was making. I was making an abstract sculpture of my mate's kitchen floor. And that was as good as it got. Yeah. And when I looked at it, and you can see it online, we'll find a picture and pop it in for those. Yeah. It's like this big bird thing flying down and then it's holding on to this sort of an egg thing that's flipping off the side. It's very monochromatic. Wait, it's wait, very so it's big. Figurative? It's very bizarre. It's abstract, but you can see this in it, right? And oh, so okay. I'm like, what the hell is this, right? <laughs> and then I started researching more. Why am I, why is this word Tao being the driving force of what the work is? Then I went and researched Tao is the missing protein in Alzheimer's genetics. What? And I had no idea. I no no idea. Now this is what I'm talking about to the art students, right. especially the spirit side 
the strength of the spirit side is divine. And I'm not I a religious freak, but it is so energy. It's all energy. And the divine knowledge of the olden days used to come down through the shaman or the daemon, and it used to come out through you, and you would have these amazing dances, amazing sculptures, amazing happenings. Well, they don't have that anymore. They put them in galleries now, put a price tag on it and go, there you go. Well, that's what they've done to art. And that's okay. It's just become a commodity and a product. But that magic and that daemon, that, that beautiful experience yeah. that happens, that magicness, that knowing that the missing protein and Alzheimer's is tau, I had no idea about that. I Nothing. That the magicness of life and death. Of yeah, but yeah. I built the sculpture before I knew what I was doing. So, right, but that's, that's the magic. It, it, well, no, that was the secret that was gifted to me to do right. this there sculpture. Was a that was the universe you or said, oh, here that. is a beautiful gift to make this sculpture. Now, if you're too busy working out how to make a living and make a work for a solo show, I mean, I've had over 100 shows, minimum. You know, I can't even say how many solo shows I've had, but I was a rabid show. <laughs> no, but I have. I've shown with great people too, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, bizarre people like Kurt Vonnegut, for goodness sake. He did the drawings, I did the sculptures, you oh, know, right. in the Hamptons. But yeah. I did 150 works for Bergdorf Goodman for the windows and the vitrines, and I sold them all, and they didn't take any money from me, so I made money. But oh, I mean, right. all these bizarre things. These good gigs. Huh? Yeah, all these good, crazy gigs. But... I, I, I didn't do them with a gallery, really. I just did them by making good art. And I think that that's what people are missing. You have to keep your channel open to evolve. Now, you're either going to hit it young, give up, or you're going to hit it older, wonderful, or hit it young and keep evolving. And you've got to work out at what stage am I going to pull away from the art scene and make a lot of mistakes and a lot of really bad art, which is what I did in 2008. I left the art scene to make bad sculpture because you can't learn new technique. You can't learn new um, ways inside yourself if you're being pressurized to make a living for someone else. Or in other words, you're talking about like, so the galleries then want to brand you, so... You brand Bell yourself. Does this yeah, but we brand She's them. not allowed no, to do that. I know, yeah, but we, I mean, I've never had a gallery that's done that to me. All my galleries have said, have, oh. at, have at it, because you just you just amuse us. So right? 2008, I mean, that was voluntary. I well, 2008 was voluntary. Like, well, it thing. was the recession, was, and yeah. people started asking for a discount. So I said, well, do you walk into Prada and ask for a discount? <laughs> right. And people are like, uh-huh. And I said, well, don't ask me. But it's but it's the recession. I said I couldn't. I said I couldn't care less, you know. Right. So I thought, well, I'm just going to make sure that I make a lot of really great work until I die. And I didn't have that long now. I'm. I mean, in 2008, I just thought physically building your work is a physical thing. I don't have people lifting my stuff. Right. I've got to work it out. You know, right. I'm not bloody little Archimedes down there with my pulley system and my chains and everything trying to lift stuff. So you've got to make a lot room to make bad art to get to the good art, which is the conversation that I'm interested in having. Not everything I make is successful. I'd say 50% of what I make is kind of crap and shouldn't be living. So I put it in buckets. You know, bring it back to life, or I cut it up and make a new work. Yeah, or repurpose I... it. Or yeah. So don't think everything you make is going to come up smelling of roses because it's not. And if everything you do is great art, then you're having yourself on. So one thing I find really interesting about your work, as I keep going on about, is a. Uh, I love your exploration of different materials, and it's yeah. like look around. Um, yeah. Bell's studio here. By the way, she has this house in Joshua Tree, wherever we are. Pioneer yeah. Town, I think, and like, she's taken over every. Yeah. So it's not a house. The whole <laughs> house is a studio. There's no room for the kids. You yeah. should see her bedroom. Like, where's the bed? Like, look at all no, the drawings. It's all it's like fucking great. No, so it's so cool. It's not that bad. And so as you're looking around, yeah, like, um, I notice all. I don't know if you call it macrame or these, yeah, uh, some tufting, the, the tufting things, and then like I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but. Uh, for the longest time, especially like in the Renaissance and before mm -hmm. the Renaissance, like yeah. um, 
the singular vocabulary for visual arts was tapestry. Yeah. It was not fucking oil no. painting. Oil painting took a long time yeah. to develop. So the yeah. best artists yeah. actually work yeah. in tapestries, yeah. right? And yeah. everybody thinks, oh, it's Michael and Raphael do all the painting. No. no. It was like the unicorn tapestries yeah. and shit like that. Yeah, next yeah, yeah. level stuff. Yeah. And so when I look around, it's really funny, not funny, haha, but very interesting that you're working in that vocabulary yeah. that tufted things and we're yeah. going to show some of these on the thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you explain some of that? Because like, you don't come across oh. other artists working with that uh, material, yeah. that vocabulary. Yeah. Like, what's that about? Yeah. Well, for me, um, I loved sewing cards as a kid. You know, sewing cards. Yeah, it's what's where they have little holes in them, and then you'd have a little fake nail. Oh, I know. And, what and you, mean. you would do the you laces. That, they were called yes. lacing cards. I remember this. I loved <laughs> lacing cards, and then I loved. That's the origin of this. Yeah. So <laughs> what happens is, is that when I do a two D painting, um, and in order to keep myself stimulated or interested in it, there's got to be many levels and layers of it. So it's almost like I used to do a lot of big soft sculptures. I used to make a lot of umbilical cords and things. What's you know? a soft sculpture? Can a soft sculpture is like a painted canvas that's stitched together and then really? makes a form. And okay. then I used to make these big sort of figurative pieces and they'd have these umbilical cords down to the earth. So I'd be attached, but the, the fabric that I'd have is I used to print on the technology when it first started. This is 25 years ago. I used to print the Milky Way on canvas. Oh, neat. And then um, after printing the Milky Way on canvas, I would then um, paint on top of the Milky Way of where I was going, my directions and stuff. Oh, and then I would stitch them into figures and big abstract sort of like mini spirits, you know. Is it two-dimensional or three-dimensional? Yeah. Three-dimensional, but two-dimensional in the creation. So they're two-dimensional right. printmaking, so two-dimensional painting. Uh, have enough tensile strength to hold the form if it's just fabric. You know what I mean? Did you ah, reinforce stuff it them. And stuff? Oh, you, okay, guys. Stuff them. I mean, I've got one in the studio right there sitting there. But the point was is that um, so it's gone from printmaking, so out of the computer, out of, into the printmaking, into the painting, printer. into the. Um, uh, just two feet Epsom, but into the um, stuffing, good. and then um, they would be attached to the sky and attached to the earth, right? So, oh, so the concept yeah. of the umbilical cord thing was all about and stitching and the stitching of because um, I used to make a lot of silk scarves, so I'd be left with these print things that I used to stitch on. Like the stitching gives an extra consciousness towards a line. So once you've got a line in a painting, that's one thing. But when you've got a stitching on that line or near that line, it creates a totally different line. Yeah, you can even language. Cast a shadow. Yeah, you know? and you can and and, wow. and that language on top of a painter painting. I don't need to paint that depth, um, although I can. But I'm creating another level. So it's sort of basically the the. The straddling between a light sketch and a sculpture. Oh, interesting. Okay, so to you, it is kind of like a little sketch, an yeah. exploratory sketch. I do, I do, yeah, but I Even don't. Even though it has this real physical yeah. presence out there. It's just it, a conscious. It feels yeah. more than a sketch when you're looking at those things. They feel quite yeah. substantive. Well, like their line work and their direction. You know how you've got like, um, you know, a lot of uh, pointless technique, for example. In a um, way, they are kind of pointless. Yeah, they are. Each because each one, unit. yeah, when you came in and you saw that piece that oh, is yeah. sold and it's going down to San Diego, oh, neat. Um, that started as a drawing around one man, and then inside that is his wife, you know, yeah. and then I painted the whole thing, then I started stitching the whole thing, and then I cut the whole thing out and put it on top of a drawing of me behind, which is black and white. Oh, so I see. it's got like 10 it's different levels. It's interesting to hear levels. this story. Like, yeah. One thing I really appreciate about your work and great art in general is like, I don't want to hear the fucking story. You're a visual artist that art should speak everything, yeah. right? You yeah, should yeah, speak yeah, yeah. volumes and keep giving. Yeah. Low light, high light, morning, noon, yeah. right? You know, uh, 
On the other hand, it is interesting to hear this story. You know, I never would have thought, oh, no. that's Belle in the back with the little yeah, black polka dots. And yeah, and I thought this is, is, I never would have even known and, there's a female well, there's figure. Well, there's a male you know and I mean? a female. The so male is and she's inside. And then that yeah, yeah. piece became a, a huge sculpture commission down for Palm Desert. We're going to show that. That's this a big piece. form with these big horns, which then became two different archetypes. He, the white bull, or the tarabolium, which is, you can look it up if you want, but it's an old story about sacrificial blood, white bulls, blah, blah, blah. And then, or the, um, the lion, um, it's not, it's a, it's the oldest known sculpture and it's in stone. And I can't remember its name because I've got too much in my brain. What are you talking about? Is that part of the That's inspiration part of the for sculpture. Piece? Yeah. Oh, I and see. And the sculpture, so it went from a drawing, tracing around these people, the clients, to a sculpture, to a painting, to a tapestry. <laughs> cool. And another neat piece uh, aspect of that sculpture, I guess it weighs hundreds of pounds. And yeah, it does. Place on this like custom oh, yeah, lazy yeah. suit. Thirty-six inch steel so, like, lazy suit. So you can be Susan. stationary, but the thing's spinning well, around. So you, you can don't get inside have... it. Huh? You get inside it. It's a human oh, shell as temples. But I like the uh, yeah, the lazy Susan concept because you don't often see that. No. I mean, you also, you I... really don't see that to scale like anything no. that spin something that's a few hundred pounds. Well, more than a few hundred pounds. Oh, My son said that's the limit. You know, his physical. Much? I think it's uh, 800 pounds. Oh, fuck off. And my son, Seriously? who's a power, yeah, he's a power lifter, and his friend picked it how up. How many people yeah. did it take? They're big. Yeah, they're I, big. Well, how many people did it take to carry that? Two. They they're, carried 400 pounds each. Well, they're power it. lifters. So Holy they shit. dragged it into place, and then they lifted it onto the... But the interesting thing about the Lazy Susan is the client has then extended the work into herself because it's at the end of this. They built the, the place especially for the work, right? They said, so you know fine. us, build us something that's us, right? So, eh, okay. And I just had a good time with it. And then I never talk yeah. about price. So they said, how much is it? When I finished it and I wrote the price, wrote the story about the work, gave them the piece of paper with the price. They paid it. Bob's your uncle. A lot better than dealing with a gallery. And then Amazing. she's making a coffee table book because every time people come over to visit them in their house in Palm Desert, they get inside the sculpture and she photographs them inside the form. Oh, that's so cool. Because it's a big shell. And so all of these people that visit now are becoming a coffee table book. That's very but neat. It's nice. It's her extension of the artwork. I know great book publishers. If she needs any tips on that oh, that's part, like, that could yeah. be helpful, but she probably yeah. has her own. Yeah, it's godly rich people. Yeah. But um, I love rich people that support artists directly, and they're people that support. People, are you kidding? They support art directly, and it's their privilege and pleasure to call. Because most, this is the other thing, artists. Nine mm -hmm. times out of ten, if you're really doing your own work, you're actually usually pretty a fucking interesting person. So people want to be near you. And if you're a working artist, then your level that you're vibrating at energetically because you're connecting with source and the work all the time, your energy level, people want to be near. Now, when you're not working, that's when you find out that most people run away from you because you get very angry and you get depressed and you get insecure. Well. But when you are really working in your element, Man, everybody wants to be near you and it's happy and it's joyful and it's a good thing to be. So even if you're feeling shitty about your work and you don't know what you want to do and you don't know what you want to make and right. everybody's an asshole, right. get to work. I don't care if you're writing poetry. I don't care if you're drawing in a book. I don't care if you're stitching a, a pair of pants. I think it's great advice. Yep. Be active. active. Do something. Because the rest yeah. will follow. The mental health will follow. Makers are meant to make. So Makers people do get stuck though. People get well, paralyzed and sometimes it's that fake it till you make it. You gotta take yeah. the first step. Well and there's the do story. Get yourself out of that out funk. Out of that funk. Like, Here's the story. People go, well it's just gonna be a new gallery that'll make you better work. Oh it's just gonna be a good critique dude's gonna write a good thing about my work. Oh in ten years I'm gonna be famous. That's gonna make good work. No. Yeah. The good work happens today. Right now. The mental health happens today. 
right now because there's no way you can get 45 years down the track building like you and I if you're sitting back here worried about they're gonna, what they're thinking when you're 19. So one thing I would like to discuss is uh, if you're into it, um, you know, so much of this is like intuitive pro mm. coming from your heart, parsing your reality, but at the same time, I know you have this elaborate theory. <laughs> I don't even know what you call it, but you don't it. So I can't even pronounce it. Can you explain oh, that a little bit? Oh, okay. Please tell me what that means. <laughs> how I used that to teach focuses you. your well, thinking. See, these are the things I don't teach at art school. Okay. And so first tell them the word. Eudaimonia uh, is a concept that's from Aristotle and it's about um, happiness and joy in self. So, really? you know, well, it's not about the gods. That's not what Aristotle was about. Aristotle was about humanness, right, and humanity. And so um, basically it's the four levels of happiness. And I used to teach this to artists when I taught um, college and I taught in community college because I'm a socialist. Next story. Um, everybody should be able to get access to me. <coughs> so the lowest form of happiness. Sounds democratic, but anyway. I am so democratic. I'm a <laughs> socialist Australian. No. That's what Terry got for Democrat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except <laughs> I really like money. But you don't have to be poor to be a socialist. So uh -huh. the, the lowest level of achieving happiness is through objects. Right? So again, we're on our nutrition pyramid. So visualize if you can. So Aristotle said that in order to get sense of self and joy and happiness is from objects, right? So I've got a Porsche. I like my posh Aristotle house. said that. Well, he didn't say I've got a Porsche. Well, no, in so many... Yeah. yeah. In my, you more, more you than, have to appreciate yeah. objects? Well, no, it's that's where you get your joys from objects. That's the lowest... That's so strange. I've never heard of that. That's the lowest level of happiness. Now, the next level of happiness is how other people see you and what you've got. And that's your sense of happiness and self, right? Oh, people think I'm great because I'm good looking. People think I'm great because I've got a Porsche. Or people think I'm great because I'm the smartest one in the room, so they're all looking at me like, because I'm the smartest one in the room, right? So that's the next level of happiness outside of objects is what other people think of you. Oh, I see. Right? The next level of happiness, right, as you're going up through the um, levels of happiness, is how you see yourself in relation to objects and other people. Hmm. So when you're standing there in front of the mirror, if you're sitting there standing in front of the mirror and you're looking at yourself and you're going, whoa, boy, you know, there's a lot of wrinkles there now and I used to be hot and rah, 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 rah. <laughs> I don't do that. If I'm standing in front of the mirror and I'm like starting to pick on myself, yeah. I stand there and I think about what I'm building right now and then I think about all the fabulous big sculptures that I love standing behind me because they're still in me. Like That's that. who I am, not this. This is just my casing to build work. But all the things that have come from me are far more who I am than my shell, my epidermis, if you will, my skin. Mm -hmm. um, and then the highest level of happiness is when you reach, you know, eudonomic happiness or completeness. Eudonomic. Yeah. Eudonomic. Yeah, eudaimonia, eudonomics, eudonomic. whatever. When you reach your highest form of happiness is when all of those things are complete, acknowledged and accepted in your life. And then you're at a level where none of them matter anymore because you've worked through getting to the highest plane. So you've worked through ownership and you feel good about that and you're done. You've worked through what other people think about you. I've already done that. I don't give a flying fuck no. at a rolling donut what anybody thinks about my work because uh -huh. frankly, they can't criticize it because I'm already doing it. So they can think whatever they want, they can say whatever they want, but it doesn't affect me getting up to going to work. That's my second level of happiness, right? What other people think of me. Couldn't care less. Third level of happiness, I stand in front of the mirror. Sure, some days there are more wrinkles than others. Some days you think you look better than others. Doesn't matter. Some days you're 10 pounds heavier. Some days you're 10 pounds lighter. Irrelevant, because inside myself is all of this. That's who I truly am. So now, I've managed to work through my level of happiness that when I go to sleep, and I'm not saying it's always like this. There's a lot of times when it's not, especially when you've got children and 
economics and stuff like that. Life happens, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> genuinely, I'd say a good 75% of my life, I go to bed with a smile on my face and I wake up with a smile on my face and I genuinely am happy. Okay, so just for clarification, That's what just it, bear with me. Like, so eudaimonia, eudaimonia you know, it's just like a, is a bat. something you were arrived with or something that you use as a scaffolding to try and achieve or something that you try it's and a, teach art students? I t t well, I live it, so I teach it. You live it. So it's but it's one of those things you discovered because you were already living it and you just got yeah. this concept it's to philosophy. describe I just, who you are yeah. anyway or the no, I philosophy just read came first, you know what I mean? No, I read, I read a lot. So when I come across things that I don't understand, like yesterday I wrote something and I wrote especially and specially. And I went, gosh, I don't actually know the difference between those two. Right. And the where it come where the word comes from from the Greeks and what it actually means like so my brain wanted to know and so when I read about you know samsara and you know um, uh, all the well different ways of thinking um, that's just one more different way of thinking right and so in order to enjoy those different ways of thinking well you've got to be curious and if you're not curious then, you know, you're going to have trouble staying interested in life. And curiosity is something that makes, for me, a more interesting process of building. Like, I am an avid audio listener. I mean, I will listen to everything all the time, as much books as I can, and I can't tell you what I'm listening to right now. I'm listening to Cars, which is that brilliant... It's If nobody's listened to it, go and read it um, um you know um what am i interested in right now well i'm interested in as usual cephalopodic tendencies meaning uh -huh. anything that's got to do with fingers and transmission of um that means octopi for people that don't know it's not just cephalopod is, oh it's well, not well, it's the, a cephalopod okay so the difference I thought between it was octopus is yeah octopi. it is it uh -huh. is but the difference is the nervous system uh -huh. right so in in cephalopodic tendencies or in there's Two different nervous systems, and I reckon that when the aliens come down, if you've ever seen that film Contact, you see that oh, yeah. if the aliens come down, they wrote in the ink, right? So if the aliens came down, when we sort of like, now, that's another thing about whether or not you believe in that the man created God from clay or clay created man and made God, that's another concept. But when the meteorites came down and hit the earth and then stimulated the clay and the primitive organisms and they think that those hitchhikers in those rocks and people are fighting about this at the moment so yeah. um started the early signs of life so whatever so cephalopods is there's two different ways of the development of humanity there's the binary nervous system which is us beep, 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 beep. Ref, left hand right hand left hand right hand brain 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 or there's the cephalopodic nervous system, which is called the lateral nervous system, which uh -huh. means that it has a spraying, like a starfish nervous system. All right. Now, that starfish nervous system is a totally different um, way of moving through your environment as compared to us. We went upright or we went forward, so our eyes said, oop, there's the sun, we've got to look out for things. Oh, there's a... An, an animal coming our way yeah. or down shit what's coming from the bottom like so our eyes became our Fantastic definition of space yeah. so we only needed these wah, 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 wah. pretty primitive now cephalopods who developed along another line the the lateral nervous this or the um starfish nervous system for want of a better word okay um those dudes take for example an octopus it has a brain in every arm has pain sensors in every arm. It can like make decisions. Nine. Say? Oh, nine. Are there nine? Yeah, nine has to... eight arms and a, and a, yeah, and, and a brain oh. at, the t at the central That's central crazy. brain. And so um, I think they've got. A, a, I might be wrong, but I think, have, I think they have three hearts. But do they? 
They can they all work together or work separately. Both. Like what one brain says, no, I'm going this way, and the other arm brain says, no, I'm going that way, and they Well, then the divide, decider <laughs> makes the definition. Oh, so it's a decision. hierarchy. But the one in the middle yes. gets to call it. Exactly. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, is that they can be doing many things at once. Now, right. this leads me into the conversation of who artists are. Like me, I'm cephalopodic, right? I can build without thinking. My yeah. Fingertips are as fast and as conscious as a piano player. Yeah. I don't have to you see my work. You close your eyes half to, the time. Well, I, don't, it, right? I don't need to see it I to build it. I know what you mean. Isn't that what yeah. people think that's so contradictory? Yeah. But I get you. I, I don't, don't need, need to build to. Th I don't need to see it to build it. I get it. You know, and so, and 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 that's why people can do. You can actually paint that way too. I paint yeah. that way. Like you can't because no. you're feeling it. You yeah. Know, you don't always need. Very weird. Well, no, it's people. That's hard to convey. <laughs> yeah, but it's not, with your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I used to, I, t I do like to teach that, you know, or draw. Put something in a paper bag, or get get somebody to put something in a paper bag and give it to you, and you give somebody something in a paper bag for you, and then you put that under the table. Stick your hand in, have a feel of it. Don't give them anything obvious. Find them something unusual, and then draw it. Oh, that's cool. And then draw that's what you're feeling, one. and that'll yeah. make you think about what you're feeling, which will translate into, that's another way to understand form. So, stepping back a bit to the artist, which is what the point of this fucking podcast is for me, it's not just about me, I'm trying to give information about how I got to not top myself at almost 60 and still making sculpture, big, and doing it happily. We have these brains, which are like cephalopodic, but their brains, right? So you and I and visual artists can do many things really well at the same time. Now people would say, oh, well, that's just ADHD. No, it's not. It's highly focused, highly trained, highly intuitive. You're creative, you're curious, you're all of these higher evolved thinking humans. Now, it might feel like it's a mess in your brain because there's so much going on. Right. But the secret is to understand that that's actually a gift and that the highest need and concept will come to the service consistently if you're quiet enough to allow the daemon or the genius, as they used to call it, or the genie or the demon or whatever, the, um, to come inside you right. and push whatever is necessary to the surface. Now, that, that's a quiet movement. But you're not crazy, you're not schizo, you're not running around bouncing from medium to medium. It's actually how you gather information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't go along a railroad track. You're going underneath the earth, on top of the earth, you know, um, like a lot of the time I talk about bringing the phonic up to the ethereal, you know, working right. the underneath of the earth up into the sky. You know, a lot of my work is based on that because it comes from the earth, a lot of the clay. So so for the, for the student out there wondering why they haven't picked a medium yet, that's possibly because you will be working in all mediums all of your life. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um what do you have next? You want to tell people like, uh, oh, where doing? can they see more of your work? You know, uh, yeah, online. Like, why don't you? Yeah, say well, it's fun. Follow me on Instagram. I'm a little bit slack sometimes because I get so busy and I'm yeah too busy to do that. And I think oh, I don't want to overwhelm anybody because I've made twelve paintings and four sculptures in the last two weeks, and people go, oh, you work so much, you know. And it's just like, well, don't fire hose. Yeah, Jesus. it's like. <laughs> It's like, don't say it like it's a bad thing, dude. Have you ever no, I don't maybe, mean that No, at not all. you. I'm not, just yeah. like, dude, if you're saying that I'm working so much, maybe you're just not working enough, dude. So stop looking at me and get working on your own. So, right. so yeah, and then I've got a big, the Highway 62 Art Tours is in October up here in Joshua Tree. Okay. And it's really great fun. I've done it since 2016. There's and a cool art scene out Yeah, here, right? there's about 130 studios open and my whole property, which is two and a half acres of big sculptures everywhere, Right. is open to the public so you can just come and wander the gardens and and have a look you know i mean cool i don't know and this is the thing like again i can't stress enough for art people who are 
struggling especially because we need, look, seriously, we need you. We need you to struggle. We need you to be insecure. We need you to be um, lost. We need you to be um, all of those things in order to find your spirit of work because all of the young artists now are saying and doing things that I can't understand because they're a generation that is seeing things differently to me. Yeah, these yeah. are these techno kids like my children yeah. who are phenomenal. And people go, well, technology's bad. I'm like, are you kidding me? I walk out in the supermarket with my daughter or my son and they're just like, beep, or Bruh, with their phones or they're this or they're that. And they're like, dick, 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 dick. no, mum, that's not true. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> or they'll do it to teachers or All something. Kids, they and know they, everything. But they do, Literally. and they're wonderful. <laughs> and this is the new art generation. So we have to say to them, you know, be your own groove. Don't think that art is a commodity. Art is a spiritual vocation of joy and happiness. And guess what? You don't have a choice. Right. It's like when somebody say, when people say, well, I became a priest or a nun because I heard the voice of God. Well, I became, calling. it was a calling, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I never got that, but I can tell you what, I've had Vincent van Gogh standing in the corner bollocking me, saying, more yellow, more yellow, or I've had, you know, um, different I entities. I know you mean. I've had that. Yeah. Augustine's yeah. ghost. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I just have gone on. Or, I just have Brock yeah. and yeah. visited me. So exactly. Like that. And it, it was the, such a fucking gas. And I it is. It is. It. And I've had these. And it friends. felt real. It is but, real. Okay. It is real because <laughs> guess what? When you do, and their channel is like, I've had Yo-Yo Rover sitting there with these big wooden forms going, come on, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, you yeah, scary. Get deep into it. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. here's the thing about that is, is that if you truly believe energy is life, which we know is a fact, when somebody passes, you will understand more about that. That's very close to you. But mm. the chain of knowledge and existence and humanity and and um, warm fuzzies, if you will, <laughs> um, are all connected. So we have a, a vision and a visual to continue, but I'm part of a very long fucking genetic chain right. of makers. Yes. Doesn't mean my grandfather was or my great-grandmother was. Might have been Lucy, you know, I'm always already all the way back in Africa. Or I'm a Wangina as an Australian Aboriginal sculptor or whatever. All of those genetics and all of those energies are me. So don't let contemporary time and contemporary fashion block that channel. No, it's like part of it, yeah. Well, no, but... it, it, it'll destroy you. It will make you sad, bitter and insecure. You have to separate the art from the marketplace. What do you think about artificial intelligence? And I all fucking that? love it. The other day, um, somebody put in my name to write my my um, bio because I had to do a new biography for this book thing, and yeah. I didn't want to do it because I always write my own. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, oh, come on, I'll do it for you because he's in the bottom of the metaverse, like he's a programmer. And he said, oh, come on, let's do it just for fun, right? Okay. So he popped my name in, and it was brilliant. No way. It was so good. That's and I sent it so off. So cool. And I wrote and I wrote written by AI and sent it off to the people and I just said they wrote it better than I could. What do I think of artificial intelligence? I think it's an extension of our spiritual knowledge. So but when you're talking about writing, that's like chat GPTs, but what about like uh, the visual AI programs and stuff, you know? Well like, they're all uh, part of it. They're all part of it. They're just as important, like, you know. My so you're ex. not afraid, you, you think of it like as a tool and it's useful and it's fun and... Well, that's not, not going to teach them to think. People who use 3D machines to make a small sculpture a big sculpture are doing the same thing that Michelangelo and Leonardo and, and Bellini and blah, blah, blah did. Or even the pyramids. They used people to make their shit big. Well, machines are just using machines to make their shit big. That's not what I do. That's an, an artificial intelligence in so much as outside of the age of mechanical reproduction, which means that we're introducing many different ways of thinking to make one form. Mm -hmm. 
um, the thinking still has to come from somewhere, right? So if they're stealing from Picasso and me and somebody else and they're making something, you know, like because we're all on the web together, you know, well, great. Right. But right. Picasso was still there, Sibel was still there, and so is yo yo Roba. All they did was do exactly the same thing I do when I'm sick of looking at a sculpture. Cut and paste. Chop it up. AI is not a progression of, for me, of humans becoming less humans. It's just humans being organised, right. if you will, in a broader spectrum, which is just worldwide web shit. Mm -hmm. It's, that's all, for me, that's what I guess it is. I feel like completely different from uh, the artist's perspective because uh, to me it's all about curiosity and exploration and finding out something about yourself and the work while you're doing it and not having just like this answer uh, spat out to you, you know, uh, online and stuff. And uh, But that's me. I have other friends that... Um, are actually using AI to generate new works, and I guess they're making paintings from what the painting generates. So, and some of them are pretty bitching, <laughs> like they're coming up with some really cool things because of the AI thing. So, you know, it's a yeah. different process, and they're using it as a tool. And to me, it's like, Bleh. to me, the satisfaction is doing it myself and going through that journey and not just plugging in some parameters. Like, oh, here's your answer. And that, that to me is not a satisfying process. I like getting dirty in the yeah. materials and the physicality and all that. Yeah. The, the real world dimensionality. And that's what I cannot stand about the whole AI thing. But uh, but for me, I think that it's a natural progression of the human evolution. So I cheer it on. It is. And I, I, I enjoy that. it. But at the same time, for me, I'm a primary maker. So every move I make is made in real time. And that's how I get to the end of a sculpture. And I have to have be viscerally engaged with the work in order for it to become. But right. let's say, perfect example, I love dumping on architects because I wanted to be one, but I didn't. Um, so I always have a go whenever I can. Architects, right, when mm. they design these big housing units for things to go on, mm. right, which is normally what they are, and then they get down the bottom and they go, oh, we need a sculpture. So they draw this shit yeah. and then they go, oh, well, there's stick some water in it and we'll call it a sculpture. <laughs> so so architects and sculptors are not Gaudi. I'm not talking about people like that yeah, or Gary or sculpt, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's another thing. But I'm trying to say is it's like, well, you know, uh, I'm really, all I'm trying to say is, is that AI... Crystal Kids, new technology, all of that stuff is always going to be here no matter what. And we're going to keep evolving. And accelerate. Yeah, and I love it. More and more and more I love it. I love the fact that my daughter doesn't have to go to school for eight hours, six hours a day and learn from one person because she can knock that stuff out in an hour. It's going to be an interesting road ahead of us for sure. Yeah, <laughs> don't you reckon? I do. I think it's fun. I'm not uh, afraid of AI. Like a lot of people think it's going to destroy the world and we're going to have ways. It's going to take over the nukes. Do, do, do. All that stuff will happen. But there will be counterbalances too. And also fucking AI is You're going to take over the nukes. <laughs> you know, like we're hardware. You yeah. know, like that shit is software. That yeah. you can chill up. It's like, well, you can't use that stuff without the hardware, right? So like, no, I, I think it's fascinating. That's a really good point. Right. So, um, I think this has been really fun and satisfying and fun in a yeah. meaty kind of way, you know? Well, like the, you know, we're not here to, you know, eat bonbons and cheer each other on. We're here to try and hopefully, if people land on this and want to watch it, they're going to think, well, okay, um, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste their time. I want to give something of what I've yeah. learned. I don't need them to l look at my work, judge it, and cheer me on. I'm, I can cheer myself on. But I do want to be able to tell people that if you are working in the arts and if you are insecure and if you are not sure, keep working. It will change. Your feelings will change. You'll be closer to the work. Don't worry what other people think. They are not the judges of you. 
Beautiful. Yeah. Very inspiring. And that's what I want. I really want people to keep making and not give up. All right. Very well, cool. Well, thank you for inviting me on the yeah, podcast. For being my first interviewee or whatever. That I means. think it's great. I think it's great. Like he says to me, yeah, you should do it. You should do it. Because imagine if Cezanne or, or Van Gogh, or we had this on, 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 on video and we could hear them talk about their stuff, you know? Imagine how rad that would be. I, I love thinking, it. Your kids, your grandkids, yeah. people, like that. Yeah. they're going to see your personality. Like, I know your work talks. Your work speaks volumes, but... Here they hear you yeah, yeah, yeah. and your funny laugh, your little uh, yeah, upside, it on. all that shit. That's so invaluable. Yeah. So it's like, why not? Like our yeah. version of AI, our version of whatever using technology, yeah. you know? And like, also art is very much controlled by a lot of people, but they can't control us. Yeah, exactly. We can we podcast own this anything. Yeah. We're teaching, you're teaching yep. to the future, the people we now. Are. It's like one and it's going to keep on giving. Like your work, you know, yep. so. And we're not giving, we're not <laughs> asking permission to be ourselves. Yeah, right. Fuck no, that. Man. Okay. We're doing what we do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Go hit the button. Bye, <laughs>